Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Enough to Keep Going podcast. This is episode number 52 for Tuesday, July the 10th, 2018, just in case you didn't know what the year was. This is our weekly gaming experience show, but this is always going to be our weekly gaming experience show now. Yes, that's right. We are going to keep our Tuesday shows now, the gamer experience show, where we go through and talk about our games from the following week. It'll be a couple weeks now since we, we took a week off last week. And we split off our uh, discussion show, which we used to kind of uh, go back and forth with. Uh, now that's on Mondays. It's kind of ju- uh, mixed in with our news program. So we did our first episode yesterday. That's called Deep Dive. So that was episode number one. Exciting. Uh, but tonight, we're going to talk about games. Lots and lots of games. Games, games, games. Just like my, uh, my little title there says. But before we do that, let's introduce our other hosts. We have Mr. Swiss Guard. Swiss, it's been all about 24 hours, not even. How's it going? Not too bad. Not too bad. I wish I had more games to contribute to tonight's episode. That's my only regret. <laughs> That's all right. Whatever you can you can give us, we'll talk about. And of course, we have our uh, technology heart of the show, Mr. Agascles Stamos. Agascles, how are you? Good, good. Glad to be back. Excellent. All right, so we're going to get started here. Uh, well, we would usually go with our report out of um, of our gamers, um, what well, uh, pick gamers, the gamer pick uh, game. That is for Mr. DBQ Hams, who is not here today. So it just kind of worked out where he wasn't going to be on the show. So we'll give him an extra week to uh, play the Humble Bundle uh, pack that we picked for him a couple weeks ago. So we'll kind of skip that and just jump into our uh, game chatter here. And I will go first with some Xbox One uh, games or game. I'll I'll just start with one. Uh, I was playing a little bit of PUBG again this, uh, actually this past weekend because I didn't play a lot of Xbox the previous week on uh, July 4th. So uh, I was playing that. And I picked up, uh, when I came back from uh, my little vacation there, I picked up Red Faction Guerrilla Remastered. I just like to say that because it kind of ticks people off sometimes. Just because it's kind of a bad... uh, bad word there i guess uh so that was cool i actually streamed a little bit of that uh this past weekend and i just kind of i just it's kind of a goofy kind of just fun game to play with because it's you got the destructibility from um the the different buildings and and towns and and whatnot that you can you can go through for your missions and stuff like that it's basically all all you're doing is destroying stuff and just finding different ways that you can destroy things so uh, i did that i'm enjoying it just like i did what i think it was released in Man, I can't remember now when it originally released on the 360, but it was a while ago. Uh, but it's just as fun now that I'm playing it on the Xbox One, so I've had a lot of fun with it. I think it was 2009, I want to was say. Was it 9? Okay. I think it was 9, uh, because I had occasion to look that up, because I also picked up Red Faction Guerrilla Remastered. on nice. P- On PC, though. On PC? Yeah. Now, did you have it already before or no? I didn't, uh, but uh, I got a handy-dandy little alert that it was uh, on sale for 10 bucks, and I was like... Pfft. Why would I not but do that? <laughs> <laughs> so did you get a chance to play it yet? Or? I haven't had a chance to play it yet. No. Oh, okay. Did you play it uh, before? So I played it? the original Red Faction, and this has always been a curiosity. I, I won't get into it because I want you to get through your section while I'm getting the social media out, but I played the original Red Faction, which had that first destruction engine in it, right. which, which predates um, uh, Battlefield Bad Company and its destruction engine. So so I had kind of become... In, becoming <laughs> I kind of become familiar and accustomed to that type of gameplay and like that that uh, almost kind of that just cause three kind of uh, random event uh, occurrence so um, so I've always found I I found it funny that you dug that you dug gorilla having not played red faction um, but you know yeah and that was well actually I did, I did play the original ones Um uh, I think just the first one. I, didn't, I I think there was a second one, and those were that the original ones were in first person. This is a, a third person uh, action game, uh, Gorilla. So, but I did play a little bit of um, mostly the multiplayer. Uh, me, the couple of the guys at work, we used to actually, you know, during a lunch, we we throw it on our PCs and you know and play uh, just the goofy mods and stuff that you could put on it. So it was cool. So I never actually played like the you know the, the story mode. So uh, you do probably have one up on me on that. Um, yeah, I'm enjoying it. Uh, definitely, I would say definitely buy, especially if you buy it on PC, you can probably buy it pretty cheap. Uh, I think it was 30 bucks on, on Xbox One, and I had some credit, so it wasn't that bad. So I, it was kind of a no-brainer for me. I was going to pick it up either way. So, And it's a discounted price, so that's nice, too. 
Uh, so let's jump over to Mr. Swiss Guard. It looks like you're playing or maybe even gone through one of the God of Wars, one of the past God of Wars, it looks like. Uh, a very past God of War. <laughs> uh, so I picked up God of the new God of War for PS4 a month or so ago. But before I started it, I I wanted to familiarize myself with the series more. Um, I think back in February, when you guys picked the original God of War for my plays segment, and I put some time into it for those two weeks. And so I, I wanted to revisit it and actually complete the game. So I've, I've spent most of my time playing, most of my limited time, gaming time playing God of War, and I, I completed it sometime over the 4th of July week. And um, it was interesting because it's been a long time, I think, since God of War came out. <laughs> and I think gaming has, you know, I don't really think about gaming having evolved that much in my lifetime. I mean, I guess I've been playing a long time, but it, it just, you go back and you look and you're like, wow, you know, games were pretty different then. And the biggest thing that struck me about the original God of War, both the new one and, and the, the original, I, I'm see, I'm watching my wife start the new one. So I'm, I'm kind of in, immersed a little bit into that. But they definitely both funnel you into, as DBQ says, uh, the kill boxes. Um, so you wander around, you find you get into a kill box, like a, an, an arena or whatever, and you slaughter some enemies. And when that room is cleared out, you, you move on. Um, I see that lineage still in the new God of War from the old one. But the thing that was most interesting to me about the original, original God of War. One is kind of the fixed camera angles. That was kind of, it was like they're still working with the cameras. And I think I mentioned that during my play segment. But the other thing was the platforming elements. And I think that was what tipped this game as having been PS2 era. I have the PS3 remastered edition. So, you know, it looks pretty nice in HD. But just there's a whole room where like, you're tight roping on rafters in the ceiling while they spin some blades around. And there's a whole section where it's just a bunch of platforms. And then you go on these spinning uh, cylinders with blades and you have to time it right. And you have to make sure. And I was like, dang, I don't recall having played anything recently with that level of, um, with that level of like platforming, mechanic uh you know mario is a platforming game but even that wasn't as annoying as the god of war segments were and it is it definitely felt like it slowed the game down and, and was a little bit filler so you know i I enjoyed my time playing it. Like, you know, I, I got over the quick time stuff and I just started to ignore the fact that I had to do quick time to take down enemies. And I just kind of played it and, you know, wrapped it up in 12 hours. But it definitely, looking at that and then having watched my wife play the new one, I'm like, wow, you know, gaming has, has evolved over time. And I think for the better. But, but yeah, that was that was my primary so was there still is there still a quick time in, on the new God of War? Quick time kills or any kind of quick time stuff that you remember? I want to say that there were some. I mean, yeah, there's there's definitely some like finishing move stuff. I think I I recall seeing, but my wife is really bad at it, so <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of hard to judge the game because. But yeah, there, I, I, yeah, there there are definitely points where you have like finish, just like you would in the old one like to yeah. like, you know every 15 hits or something that you take that you hit like a really big monster you have to hit some type of combo to to, to move on to the next segment of combat or something like that there is a and i know specifically there is a incredibly aggravating fight i would say in the first two hours of the game um that that has several sequences of that uh, to the extent that it almost made me put the game down. But um, for yeah. I'm not gonna. It, I don't think it'll be spoilers 
using this. Was it with the stranger? Right. Right. right, right. Yeah. yeah. My wife had that same sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I remember playing the the first one, like not the remastered, but the you know the original one back in the day, and it, I probably got like a third of the way through. Um, you know, and I enjoyed I enjoyed it for what it was. It was something different at the time, at least for me. Um, but I, I I think I got because it was kind of a more of a puzzly kind type of uh, puzzle element here and there, right? I mean, nothing. I mean, nothing wanna, hard, but you know, nah. Like there was like one room was like there were spikes that came up through the floor. So you you flip the switch and it allows you to grab a box. So you had to push across the floor, climb on the box, and climb up to the ledge before the little spikes come up. And yeah, it's kind of a puzzle because it's like, oh, okay, what do I do with the box? Oh, crud, there's a time limit. But, you know, most of it was fetch this key, bring it to this room. So it wasn't nothing. It wasn't a water temple, that's for sure. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, cool. So I, I, all in all, like, I'm like, it's nice that I played it. Um, do I feel like God of War deter deserves some uh, pedestal, right? At, at the moment, do I feel like God of War deserves some a pedestal in the pantheon of great gaming intellectual properties? No, but it was it was nice for what it was. All right, cool. Well, I mean, at least you, you got through it and enjoyed it. I'm surprised that you said it was like, 12 hours it took you? I think About... it took me 10 to 12 hours yeah. with the time. I mean, I probably died a lot, so that time is probably <laughs> the optimistic side. But Okay. That's still pretty decent, though. I mean, for back in the day, too. So... All right, Mr. Agascles, looks like you got some PS4 action here at the beginning of your list. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so I've been trying to turn over New Leaf, uh, partially because I uh, uh, have been positively encouraged by uh, some of the lines of questioning that uh, Swiss has been giving me a, a couple times on like the games I play and, and why I put myself through certain things. Um, you didn't throw out the spreadsheet, did you? I have not been tracking on a spreadsheet, no. Uh, oh, I thought you did. I did. I, I was, uh, but I, where I'm kind of settling in on, on how I'm gaming right now, like I don't care as much um, about the specific metrics uh, because um, because every game that I'm playing, I'm, I'm putting, you know, a chunk of time into it, a, a little less of the hopscotch kind of style that, uh, that I have been... Um, that I have been applying, right? So usually, um, it's more frequently that I'm sitting with a game for four to eight hours uh, in a sitting instead of like two, uh, and then going on to something else. Um, so I spent a huge chunk of time in uh, Dishonored uh, this past weekend, and actually, uh, it's, I didn't put it on the list, but before that, I'd spent a huge chunk of time in uh, in Titanfall two uh, on PC. Um, but but after that, I rolled over to the uh, PlayStation Four uh, OG because I still. I don't know, put some reps on that thing, trying to get all my ROI out of that unit um, during uh, for the remainder of this generation. But um, but I picked out Dishonored. Uh, now I played Prey last year, so Dishonored is by Arcane Studios, uh, the same developer that did uh, Prey and of course did uh, OG Dishonored, um, and it's built on their Void engine, which I think is the same engine that they built Prey on. Um, they have a very particular artistic style. Uh, uh, one of the reasons that the uh, uh, gaming superlatives category of like best uh, marketing art or whatever sprung to mind when we were doing last night's show was because um, Arcane Studios kind of cracks me up because when you look at their box art from game to game, it's kind of the same. Like you could you could almost like just swap the title and and put Prey on the Dishonored two box and it would kind of still work. Um, but uh, Dishonored is one of those game Bethesda games that for me I probably uh, I probably wouldn't normally stick with. Uh, it has, uh, I think I mentioned this a little bit last night, it, it has a bit of a high degree of uh, friction up front just in terms of, uh, of learning its systems and understanding how you call up powers, understanding what powers are. Uh, it has a pretty complicated, I might almost argue overly complicated system of abilities. Uh, you have weapons, uh, but then you also have um, uh, bone charms but then you also have powers, uh, and you hunt for runes uh, to unlock both bone charms and powers, but they're not the same thing. Um, and so getting through that was a bit murky and kind of turned me off at a certain point. 
because I didn't really fully grasp and understand how what the progression model was. Um, and then there was one point where I gained uh, a power, and I had one power for like a very long period of time. And I've probably put about eight hours into the game so far. Um, and I felt like I had that one power for a very long period of time, and I picked up like a couple bone charms, and I was like, so what am I doing this for? Um, again, kind of like in the way that I mentioned Far Cry, Far Cry took me a while to get my head wrapped around how I wanted to play, because how you approach Far Cry 5 kind of determines what you're going to get out of it. Dishonored is a bit the same way. The very first level, uh, you're, you know, you, you get the huge opening, uh, you know, theatrical opening scene. It kind of sets the tone for the movie, right? Um, you know, basically you're, uh, after the events of the first game, you know, you're, you're, you're installed on the throne. Um, a long lost relative of your mother shows up and lays claim to the throne. Um, and, and one of your own uh, lieutenants or members of your cabinet or whatever uh, sides with her and turns on you and, and stages a coup, um, and murders all your allies, and you are uh, immediately imprisoned. So the game kind of opens up with you trying to initially escape. So in that initial escape, there's no time to hunt for runes. I, at least I chose not to. I just wanted to get out of there. Um, the second mission, uh, you are kind of put on uh, on this on this island. It feels a lot like Shutter Island because you're at this uh, asylum slash medical facility uh, that is off the mainland. Um, and and while I was there, I, I kind of you could kind of tell what the end game for that mission was and where the bosses were going to be. So so I said I was like, well, look, I'm going to make sure that I'm as powerful as I can possibly be before I face them. So I'm just going to go on a rune hunt. And, and at that point, I think I'm in the fourth mission now. By about the third mission, and the mission is anywhere from a one-hour to two-hour block of time, I kind of settled into the paradigm and approach that I was going to take, right? So, so now what I do is, when I, when I go to a level on a new mission, the first thing I do is I try and hunt, I try and find the black market, which is, this is yet another thing in this highly complex series of progression on, on, on how to approach it. At the black market, you can buy upgrades for your weapons, uh, and you can buy extra ammunition, um, and you can buy special items. So, so first I go to the black market and basically cash in all the ducats that I earned from the last mission, right? And, and upgrade, uh, upgrade uh, powers and weapons. From there, I then the whole thing is a big rune hunt, and that actually formulates the large amount of time that I spend on that level. Um, I basically, there's this thing called the heart that you equip, which is this kind of grotesque, beating steampunk heart, or, you know, clockwork heart that you hold in your hand that reveals the locations of all the runes. Um, you don't want to, so it's, it's a, it's a dual wielding game. You can wield a weapon and a power, uh, kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a lot kind of Bioshockish, um, in, uh, in, in that way. Uh, so, so. When you put the heart away, you can't see all the runes, but if you, you can lock onto one rune and that thing's position will stay persistent on your HUD, you'll always know where that is even when you put the heart away. So I basically play in this, in this cascading manner of, of locking onto each heart, tracking it down. Um, in the course of doing so, you, you happen to complete other mission objectives along the way. And then once I've collected all the runes and upgraded all my powers and capabilities for that level, um, I, I may go back and hit the black market one more time, but then typically I proceed on um, to the final, you know, to the this primary side mission and the and the end game mission. So uh, it was about hour four where I finally felt like, okay, I have enough of an array of tools now that this is actually cool and fun, and I don't and I feel powerful. I don't feel like I'm just being hunted and I'm and I'm fodder. So. Uh, so this, I mean, it, it was a 2016 uh, action adventure game of the year at the Game Award Show. So, um, you know, I pray I felt like got uh, got undersold um, in the Game Award Show and other media uh, awards for last year. So, getting back to uh, the game that preceded it and, and did get a lot of critical acclaim has been uh, has been fairly interesting. So, I, so. I, I guess, from what I heard, I guess this is kind of a it can be a stealthy game. Do you play it at all that way, or are you more kind of not guns blazing, but whatever magic and power and weapons well, blazing? Well, that's what kind of it's another key component that kind of almost turned me off in the first four hours because in the first four hours, 
you don't have a lot of powers, so you're kind of incentivized to play a little more stealthy. The other dynamic in it, right, because, like, it's every thir- every 30 seconds I throw out yet another thing for this game, right? The other <laughs> dynamic in it is um, the more you kill, the more it Im- it's going to impact the type of ending you get in the game. Um, and there's they, they refer to it in the tutorial writing as, as the cynical ending. Um and, uh, and you can tell whether or not you're killing too much because when you go into the game save and at each mission end mission screen, it tells you your chaos level that you invoked on that level. And if it says high chaos, then you're doing too much killing. Well, first of all, when the game first opened, I was kind of pissed off that these people had shown up and, and killed all of my allies, including some people that they clearly telegraphed to you are really good friends of yours. So I was like, yeah, you guys are you you guys aren't getting the non-lethal takedowns, right? So um, it was about the second level that I was like, oh, well, maybe I'm killing too much. Uh, so I, I I tried to walk that back a little bit. I also finally figured out the control that you use for a non-lethal takedown, not knowing that so, kind of. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Swiss. I was gonna say, so does that imply that they are discouraging killing? Like, is the chaos ending the quote-unquote bad ending, I, I, or is it just a different ending? I, I think I think what they're encouraging you to do is to make a choice one way or the other. Yeah, it's just a different ending. I don't think it's a punitive ending. Um, you know, there is kind of a mid-level, and I think that's maybe what they're trying to get you to shoot for is to do a little balance and, like, not just rage kill everyone, but to maybe, you know, kill some and, uh, and, uh, and, and non-lethal take down some others. So, so but, yeah, prime, that, that I'm kind of like you, like, I, like... Splinter Cell is not something that I'm like inherently wired for, um, yeah. But 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 the difference is with something like Splinter Cell. The reason I typically hate stealth games. Same thing with like the original Deus Ex is if you did go if you did go on the offensive, you would just get pwned, right? You you were not powerful enough to contend with as few as like two guards at once, and that's aggravating and frustrating this is not that like you are you are a bad behind and you have good weapons and if if people roll up on there's one point uh I, so i did a bunch of game captures and a couple live streams actually uh, this weekend um, which if we have time maybe we'll talk about a little bit but um like there's like, like i had been fighting people and and like just wrecking them and then at one point this guy's coming around the corner and i'm like i'm just gonna totally indiana jones this guy right like i like and, and he came around the corner, and I just one-shotted him with the pistol, and I'm like, that's that's what happens when I lose my tolerance, right? I have no more tolerance for these, right? I just, I'm just i ready to go on and complete the mission. I'm tired of, like, fighting people. So, um, you, so you're not nerfed uh, in, in that manner, but... That's, uh, that's an interesting way you put it. As someone who likes stealth games, Splinter Cell and Metal Gear Solid and whatnot, um, I don't... I never viewed it as a handicap. I viewed it as... Um, I'm dangerous, but not like the game isn't just throwing me a bunch of cannon fodder. Like it's actually supposed to be challenging me to use my intellect and my ability to to navigate the map. Um, and and I enjoy that as a reward for the experience. But we're gonna have to like maybe set up a time to have a stealth action genre <laughs> discussion or something well, well, but, well um, the, and the last comment i'll leave off with then is i i get that and i understand it the problem i have in terms of design and implementation is it is so i i get that you should be incentivized to use stealth but if stuff goes sideways is sam fisher just a total scrub who can't handle himself like that's that's the thing that that that's the thing that makes me angry right like it's, yeah yeah do you feel like Okay, I don't want to. We that's, we don't need to go down the rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> we can go down there. That's all right. No, yeah, that's I kind of I kind of have the be for now, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I kind of have the same sentiment. Like I, I know, you know, I know why. You know, this is a stealth game. Okay, I'm supposed to do stealth. I don't have the patience for that. And I think that was because of Metal Gear Solid. I actually played, and this is what the PS1 uh, version, the first 3D one. I did actually play that game, and I actually beat it. And man, it took me forever though, and I was just like. Just exhausted, like after pl- after beating that game. Enough of that game. I, I, I just couldn't. Enough of that game. <laughs> but I couldn't the, take it anymore. I was like, all right, I'm done. I'm never doing stealth games again. But, but my <laughs> thing about Metal Gear Solid is, I see, I feel Metal Metal Gear Solid is different than Split than at least the first Splinter Cell was because if stuff went sideways, you you could handle yourself, and and right. there was a way to get things to cool back down. 
That was my. Uh, that was gonna kind of be my question: Is do you just hate? Do you just think that Splinter Cell wasn't designed? Wasn't implemented well? Because yeah. when I think stealth action, I think Metal Gear Solid. I enjoyed Splinter Cell as well, but I, I just think Metal Gear Solid. So right, yeah. Splinter, Splinter Cell has some had some issues. It all like it, it, that. Part of the problem was it had some, in my opinion, it had some very bad uh, uh, threshold detection in the game model, where like the 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 on screen distance between you remaining stealthy and triggering the guard you were trying to sneak up on was was like a millimeter, and if you cross that line, like and so that coupled with the fact that if if so much as one guard teed off on you, right, you were toast. I, I was like, come on, um, but this is not that. I you you. And you, and you still have to think smartly. There are there are challenges that are presented to you. There are uh, in in the second mission, which is where I spent a big chunk of time and did my, my first rune hunting thing. You're able to take down some guards non lethally on the way, but then then you turn the corner and come into this room that is the dining hall, and there are like eight guards in there. You're like and you, and you take a big gasp of air, and you're like, "There's no way that either a I'm going to take all these guards on at once, or that I'm going to stealthily walk around." And, and take them down one by one, um, so so I had to do a mix of uh, of uh, you know throwing a bottle to distract some of them, leading some of them away. Uh, you can you there's a thing you they call it far reach. Um, I, I call it bamfing because it's kind of like it feels kind of like teleporting, even though you're visible when you're in transit between two points. Um, but uh, but I did a series of bamfing uh, in the vertical. That uh, that caused them to lose me, and then I was able to come back around. So you can do some very cool stuff um, if you remain stealthy. Um, probably the coolest power, uh, your first kind of boss battle. Um, there's a partic particularly dangerous foe that you encounter, um, but you get this power called I think it's just called decoy. But you can create a phantasm, a doppelganger. So you're able to create a phantasm of yourself that will cause any enemies to chase it, and if they kill the doppelganger. They will believe that they've eliminated the threat and they'll go back to low alert. Hmm. So just on a whim, I was like, man, I wonder if this will work on the boss. It did. So <laughs> the boss chased it. Um, she she wind up she wound up like going through a window and being on the other side where she couldn't get to me, but I had a line of fire. So I sat there and spam pistol on her, right? and uh, and the encounter was over. now this was after I'd been killed like three times and I had to come up with a unique tactical approach to taking her down. But it was kind of awesome. Like that's a thing that made me feel powerful because I was like, "Oh, here's like this non uh, non hard kill power that I can utilize to actually gain the tactical advantage in the situation." So it was pretty cool. Nice. Yeah, I do have to say though, uh, in Splinter Cell's defense, some of the latter games did kind of balance that out a little more, where you could kind of do a little more actiony. Uh, I think Convention Conviction played that one, and I forgot what the last one was. I think Blacklist or something like that. Uh, which I just played the demo of, but it, it was a little bit more forgiving, but still kind of like, all right, you you know, five or six guys were there, you could probably take them, but if if they added more to that, you know, you'd probably go down. So you kind of had to take them out quick or hide or do whatever. So to get that, um, you know, the warrant level or, you know, the awareness level off you. So it's pretty cool though. All right, so let's jump, let's move forward here. Uh, so I, like I mentioned earlier, I, I was on vacation last week. So brought my Switch, of course. So I play a lot of Switch games, but I'm going to go through just a couple right here real quick. Uh, Rocket League, of course, I'm in, I was playing that. Uh, I was kind of on a low... I didn't have any Wi-Fi, and I, my hotspot wasn't the greatest, so I didn't get to play online all that much. So I was kind of doing the uh, the seasons. You can do seasons offline. So I was kind of rolling through that a little bit. And then I played a little bit of Fortnite. Once again, I was only able to play like a couple of games because the, the connection was really crappy. But I did get a win, so I'm, I'm happy about that. May I, may I ask a question about that? Yeah. Was it a solo win? No, it was squad. <laughs> I still okay. have no solo wins in either Fortnite or PUBG, so I'm still looking for that solo win. Can I ask a follow-up question. <laughs> yes. Did somebody was somebody in your squad like some sort of building guru? Was there mm -hmm. like uh, dueling sky fortresses at the end game, or they, did yeah. you just take them out? No, it, it, yeah, we were building, you know, structures and, you know, doing throwing up walls everywhere. So, yeah, it, it wasn't like like just a one on one, you know, regular shootout. So we were we were doing the tower deal. So but I, I doing that, it was kind of advantageous because as that as my guy was starting to do that, I kind of like flanked the guy and went around and, you know, I shot a couple of the, of the teammates. So it, it kind of serves a purpose, I suppose. So, I mean, 
I think one on one is a little harder when you start doing that because then you know everybody just starts throwing up walls and you know you only have a finite amount of ammo, so if it, you know or a limited amount of ammo. So you know you kind of have to take care of people quickly. Hopefully you got either some kind of grenade or a rocket launcher that you can take out their structures right away. Otherwise, you know you pretty much you'll run out of ammo eventually. Still, it's cool that you got to win. Yes, so. I was very happy about that. <laughs> All right, so let's go. Let's stick with you, Swiss. Uh, you looks like you have some Witcher gaming, a little bit of gaming, I guess, that you did. Um, yeah, a little bit. So this is the, the original one, the first one. This is the original one. So I, this is um, it's probably going to be a top. I mean, this could be a topic someday of if you want to play like a new game, do you go back and play the old games first? And I'm enjoying it, but I don't know how much I want to get sucked into like a massive RPG when really I just got it because I was interested in The Witcher 3. And I wanted to know more about Geralt of Rivia before I started The Witcher 3. Um, but, you know, I throw it on there, uh, shut myself in my computer room, uh, put it on, and... I, I've been enjoying it. It's just there's going to be a decision point I'm going to have to make at some sometime whether to jump to Witcher Two or Witcher Three or you know invest in this one. The combat is interesting. I think I remember Agasocles way back when, maybe before I even joined E2KG. I think you did a a a stream of the witcher a few times. And I think that was my, the first time I actually like watched the game. Cause for so long, I wasn't really much of a PC gamer, but um, just the time clicks, uh, not terribly immersive for me. Like I, it's cool that you can swap uh, fighting styles, you know, you know, for, for, but it, it doesn't, it's not like I have to feel like tactically. It's like, oh, that guy's big and he has an axe. I better go with my wolf mode or whatever. And, oh, this guy's small and quick. Okay, so there's not really that much intelligence involved in swapping the styles, but it's cool that it's there. Um, yeah, it's all, It's always... This is probably something we, we maybe we'll talk about one day too. Like, a, a, a thing for me when I'm in that zone you're in is always this... And it's much easier to identify when it's movies... But it's always interesting to me when you you try to force yourself to go back and play this game that you like you feel like you should play, right? But in the playing, you realize, oh, no, this is like an acquired taste, right? <laughs> like, you know, everybody's been raging about this thing for years, and you're thinking, oh, I'm the guy who missed out. But the reality is, is like, the people who raved about it were the people who it was specifically for. But it's not like a great, like general audience game or or just doesn't appeal to you specifically the witcher like i like i saw the value in the witcher but like that combat system to me was like okay this is a this is a creative style choice that i don't know necessarily like suits my needs particularly i'm gonna i mean i have not i'm still intending to play i know oh we have a new segment at the end where we're going to talk about what we're going to be playing so here's a foreshadowing of that but um, I, I think I'm still going to continue it for a little while. But it, it was my biggest thing is like how much did I got to figure out? I got to read up. I'm also pretty bad about like really deep diving into to games that have been released that I haven't played because I don't want to ruin my impressions of them. So I got to find out maybe if The Witcher two and three how much that combat system has changed or evolved over time. Um, but yeah, like I said, I haven't. Mostly, I, I wanted to get through God of War, so I knew I would be free to play the new God of War on PS4, and I filled it in with a little bit of Witcher Enhanced Edition, and I didn't even... I played a very... I probably played a few matches of Splatoon 2. Um, very, very little bit of, it, of that uh, just here and there. Nice. Yeah, I, I never played... I think The Witcher 3 is the only one I've ever played. I might have started 2, because I think that was on xbox 360 at one point um but I, and usually i'm i'm kind of that way where i like to you know do it within the series i used to be now i'm just kind of like I, whatever i'm just gonna play <laughs> i don't have time to go back and play all these other games if that was the case i'd never play a, another assassin's creed again so because i'm well, way behind on those 
and and that's because we're all we all have full time jobs and families. Yes, and, and that's what it really boils down to. Because I, I look back at how much I gamed when I was in college and high school, and and I would complain that I didn't have I had too much homework or something, you know. And it's like, <laughs> oh my god, I want to slap my, my I want to slap little Greg and say, "Hey man, <laughs> wake up and appreciate what you got." Yeah, shut up. <laughs> Play your games. All right, let's jump over to. Uh... Uh, let's beam over to uh, Mr. Guest, please. It looks like you're playing a little Star Trek bridge crew. Uh, yeah, so it was pretty exciting, uh, Ben, all around. So uh, first of all, so Gray and I uh, are old uh, founder of Casual Adult Gamers and uh, the primary progenitor of the podcast series that preceded this one, the Casual Adult Gamers podcast. Uh, he and I had kind of reunited and been doing some VR episodes uh, on Sunday nights uh, and then I got sick, and then we were on travel, then Independence Day, and blah, blah, blah. And he and I finally reconnected this Sunday and got it started again. Uh, first of all, it, so, you know, I was able to put the headset on and get back into it. So, first of all, I finally got this thing, which is nothing but a little travel bag slash case for my VR headset, Windows Mixed Reality headset. It may seem like a small thing, but this is a huge get, right? Like, because my... Uh, because my headset before, I still had it, like, in the box. And so, like, uncrating it and breaking it out every Sunday night and untangling it, it was just a huge hassle. Like, it was not something that I could do in, like, 30 seconds if I was running late. Uh, so, having the bag and, and, now, and, like, the controllers were over in another place in the room and everything. So, so, that, that, so, Sunday night was the first time that I had it packed in this thing with everything all in one kit and was able to get it out quickly and get it connected and uh, meet up with him. Um there have been slow ticking changes to Windows Mixed Reality and uh, Steam VR support. Um, graphic fidelity keeps improving and getting better and better. Uh, this uh, Star Trek Bridge uh, crew was the first VR game that I've played where I've put the headset on. I'm like, oh, th this is like the VR in like the full resolution of this headset that I that I have. Um, so it was awesome. And of course, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. Um, you know, uh, sitting on the bridge of a ship in in in, in the captain's seat is essentially what, what I did for 12 years of my life in the military. So, um, you know, Gray had some experience in the game, and then there were AI uh, crew members on board. It took me a while to get into it, but I finally figured out, like, how to issue commands. And, and by about halfway through the session, I think he and I played for, like, an hour and 10 minutes, an hour and 15 um, nice. You know, we were we were able to operate uh, efficiently, um, and it felt uh, it felt very on topic. You know, being, again, being a Star Trek fan and, and sitting in the captain's chair and, and issuing commands, uh, and then and then like the last mission we had, uh, we got a little disjointed on tactical employment and maneuvering of the ship. Um, there was a there was a thing that I wanted to do that that, that we didn't do, but still, at the end of the day. Um, with, with him piloting the ship uh, and me issuing commands to tactical and engineering, um, it still all worked out well. So uh, we we actually destroyed two pirate vessels uh, during the encounter. So uh, nice. and actually successfully completed the Kobayashi Maru scenario. I mean, as successfully. I mean, we lost it, but we didn't get destroyed in the course of the, which I consider a victory. Um, so, <laughs> so can you can you pick your era of? Star Trek, or is it just one era that they uh, have right now? As far as I understand, it's one era. Uh, it's, it's an interesting. It'll be an interesting thing to dig a little more into it. You, you're given command of a, um, you know, I, I guess if 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 you think of like their timeline compared to like progression in our timeline, it, it feels to me like where the Star Trek, like the next generation kind of era, would be if it had kept going. Um, mm -hmm. Now it, it feels like you're slightly ahead of like that Jean Luc Picard era. Um, in terms of the ship that you have, it's uh, it's an Aegis class. Um, it, it's the lead ship in the Aegis class, Dreadnought or Star Cruiser or whatever, um, and uh, look, you know, lo looks like a slightly it looks, it looks like a slightly heavier variant of like an Excelsior class uh, starship. So, um, so yeah, so you're 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 in like the next generation kind of era. Um. So, I'm I'm curious because as another Star Trek fan, uh, to the point that my 11 year old daughter actually wears Star Trek T-shirts and whatnot, and got her hooked. Um, 
would this game work out? I know, I understand it's designed for VR, but do you feel like they're missing like a whole lot of people out there that don't have VR, and this game would be fun online with just your headset, and mouse, and everything? So, so it is a game, as far as I understand. I mean, based, based on Gray's uh, explanation, he he he's put more time into it than I do. And this is not, as far as I understand, this is not a VR exclusive game. So you oh, you can it? play the game with a Xbox controller. Um, and work through the interface, uh, and, and and other people and somebody else could play the game and be in VR, and the two of you could still be doing you know co-op uh, on the same bridge of the same ship. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yes, Swiss. So uh, if you if you want to get that. it and, and play some time, I would definitely be up up for doing that. All right. I'm gonna put it in my spreadsheet of wish list games. <laughs> <laughs> Dang your spreadsheets. <laughs> All right, so all right, I'm gonna jump in real quick. Uh, I had uh, I actually had played a lot of stuff, but I'm just gonna jump. Uh, I played Marvel's Superheroes, Lego Marvel Superheroes two. I started that up again. I had only played like like maybe 10, 15 minutes, so I've got at least a couple hours into it now. Uh, I'm liking it. It's more Lego, you know, Marvel superheroes, so it's awesome. Uh, I'm hoping there's like a hub world type of open world area because there was in the first one. I haven't hit that yet, but. Hopefully that'll that'll come up soon. Hopefully they still kept that in there. Uh, and then the one thing I want to talk about is Mario Tennis. I picked that up obviously for the Switch. Uh, I've been playing that. I was once again I didn't get to play any online at all. I was just playing the adventure mode, uh, which is like the story mode, and that's it's actually pretty cool. I mean, you know, for a tennis game, you'd be like, okay, what you know, what kind of story are they gonna have in it? But you know, it's it's goofy, sure. You know, there's this magical tennis racket that possesses certain characters, and you know. I don't want to get too much into it, but it's kind of a cool little story that they, they got going in, in Mario Tennis, so uh, I'm enjoying that right now. So uh, I, I don't know, did either of you pick that up or no? Okay. Uh, so let's jump back. Well, Swiss doesn't have anything else, but uh, I guess, please, what else do you got that you uh, you got into? Looks like some more PC action? Uh, yeah, I guess my last thing is, uh, so I really wanted to play some Destiny 2. Uh, this week, um, unfortunately, uh, B- Battle.net uh, was being DDoSed over the last couple of days. I don't know if they've recovered and come out of that yet. Oh, not really. Uh, I mean, yeah, 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 but uh, I could. Yeah, th- so there were there were problems uh, logging in to the service. Um, eventually, I was able to, and I had to install the Battle.net client. I couldn't even pull that down. Eventually, I was able to pull that down and reset my password. But then, over over that whole time period, I still couldn't log in. Um, and when I and at first. The first night, early, very early hours in the morning, uh, they were saying, you know, we're experiencing difficulty and techs are looking at it. And then the next morning, when I looked at it again, they were, they were said, you know, they were, um, they were monitoring. Now, it seems like they were, it wasn't them who were being DDoS, but it was some service that they're dependent upon um, that was being DDoS and was therefore impacting them. Um, so the main reason I wanted to play Destiny 2 this week was because um, the, actually the, the workstation that I'm standing at, I, I just replaced this monitor. Um, I had two 1080p monitors here and, and this runs a GTX 1060 and my plan had been to upgrade to two 4K monitors. Um, instead, I went with a 34 inch uh, ultra wide monitor uh, and I wanted to play Destiny 2 to see I assume that it's compatible with 2560 by 1440 resolution. Um, and so that, that was really what I was trying to get to, and I was really disappointed that I wasn't able to. Uh, so um, I went round robin and finally decided um, that I would check out Battlefield 1. I was a little concerned about how clunky the start of Battlefield 1 is, but it turns out with my cloud save, I had actually progressed enough to get past a lot of the introductory stuff. And I did pull that down, so I was able to dive right into one of the war stories, and I, I picked up like the Eddie Ricken... Eddie R- I don't know, I forget what the guy's name is. Rackham, Eddie Rackham, uh, uh, World War One Ace War Story, and played that. Uh, and it was pretty cool, and it worked in the resolution. And uh, and while I was playing it, I don't know how well this is going to work, because this is actually connected. I didn't really think about that. But uh, I also then used that time to start testing this thing, which is the uh, HyperX uh, Pulse Fire Surge uh, gaming mouse, which just came out, I think, like in April. So this is currently under review, uh, and uh, I was able to put it through some of its tests in, in Battlefield 1. Again, I really want to get into Destiny because I think I'll get a little more uh, test, good test data and, uh, and subjective uh, opinionating. Um, Were the colors strobing around. on that thing? Or, or is yeah, it just so the it's, way you... it's an RGB mouse, so uh, <laughs> the, much like every time you buy a new game now, you have to... Um, 
you know, pull down every publisher's, like, proprietary desktop client. Um, uh, gaming peripherals are getting the same way uh, every time you get one, like, so now I have to pull down the HyperX Intelligent client or something like that to get control of these blasted RGB lights. Um, yeah, you know, that was something that frustrated me. <laughs> Uh, yeah. There are there are companies though that will sync. So for example, in my rig, I have Corsair uh, RAM, right? And I have a a gigabyte motherboard, okay. but the RAM recognizes the motherboard and like my my RGB lights on my RAM are synced with the RGB lights on the motherboard. Oh, cool. Okay. And so that so you don't have to yeah. you don't have to use Corsair's IQ program then. No, okay. but course. But that's the only device that I have. I also have uh, this is just I think a G two O three. Okay. Yeah. Mouse. Yeah, Logitech. Uh, and I, I have a separate app for the gig, for the for the mouse from Logitech. But okay. uh, I really I never even messed with it. It's just scrolls through the colors and I don't I don't really worry about it too much. Honestly, like I think it's really cool to have all these. Like LEDs, I got because like the motherboard has LEDs on it. My RAM does. My my case is Fantex, and that taps into the motherboard, and there, yada yada. All the lights are synced with that. But I find I just set it to one light and just leave it that way, right? Because right. everything else just bothers me. So yeah, <laughs> it's, when when somebody comes in, they're like, they're not a computer person, and they see my rig, they're like, like my neighbor, they they're pretty computer illiterate i mean they're they're great neighbors right and but i'm the guy that goes over there and helps them hook their printer up right okay so she was over for one day talking to my wife and she saw the computer she's like does that computer have like a window on the side like she had never seen anything like that before but so so i impress people by oh look i can open it <laughs> futuristic oh. yeah but that's right. about it that's about it Anyway. Yeah, it's just it's an interesting approach because I uh, so so earlier this year um, I had gone and and I think I'd mentioned I'd, I'd replaced a bunch of my keyboards with ten keyless keyboards from different vendors you know just just trying to see out you know I was trying to experiment and pull the thread on how well kind of uh, lower cost hardware worked um, and uh, you know and, and if it was at parity with like name brand stuff and it is predominantly. Um, but, uh, but each of these keyboards has a lighting scheme that's entirely programmable within the keyboard itself, right? You don't need to pull down a software app. Um, but, you know, now I'm in the process of trying to convert all of, all of my gear that I... The HyperX is a, it's a review unit, um, but all of my personal gear, uh, I'm in the process of converting all of that to Corsair. And, and of course, like I said, with Corsair, um, your ability to configure lighting is fairly limited on the device. You really have to pull down their IQ program uh, to manage each individual component, so uh, so it's a slightly different way of living. But anyway, Battlefield One was fine. The mouse worked great. So uh, Destiny, I feel sad about, but uh, you know, I just I just want to add that this was a very Zeus or Agassiz specific story because we had an annoying publisher specific account <laughs> hassle, which is something that he's constantly ranting about. Uh, we had Destiny. And we had new hardware, and yes. they were all mixed into one story. So and it, I, all one, that. I know. And it actually links back because what I didn't mention in Star Trek is the first thing Gray and I had to do in order to play together was I had to download the UPlay client and actually create a new UPlay account because I think I had two UPlay accounts prior that were mapped to email addresses that I no longer have, so I couldn't recover either of them. <laughs> so. Gaming in 2018. Yeah, yeah, that's right. PETA. <laughs> Apps and all kinds of right. dumb. <laughs> well, if it's any consolation, I had a, I, I bought a, when I la bought my last headset. Uh, is for the Xbox One. I think I can use it on a PC too. But I had to download an app uh, for some audio app that I could have just used it. But you know, this is supposed to give me the best experience, so I had to do that. So even on the consoles, they they're putting it on there too. All right, so let's jump into. Actually, we're going to jump into a new segment real quick. So we were looking, you know, in the past what we have been playing, but now we're going to go forward and see what we're going to play this coming week. So just real quick, uh, we're going to go through maybe one title and just see what we're playing. And I'm besides Marvel uh, superheroes too, like Marvel superheroes too. I'm also going to be playing this. Finally got NES Classic. So I haven't. It's still in the box. Haven't even um, opened it yet. 
Hopefully I'll set that up this week and play that. Uh, Swiss, what do you got coming up? I'm probably going to play The Witcher, but I also want to download the Octopath Traveler demo. And I, yeah, so that's what I'm probably going to hopefully get to this week. Nice. All right. And I guess, please, what do you got coming up this week? Uh, well, I am going to play uh, play some Destiny 2. It's, uh, I, I kind of boxed myself in a corner, setting things up, because now this workstation is now tasked with podcasting for the rest of the week. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to wind up playing it at another workstation, but I still want to get back into it and check it out. Uh, and I'm probably going to also hopefully get back to playing a little Descent, because that's been one of my nostalgia plays uh, for the last month. The, the one thing that's concerning is now, having had our discussion last night, I was reminded that Whatever I play, I'm in a foot race to the release of uh, No Man's Sky Next, which comes out on the 24th of this month. Yes, yes. Can't wait for that one. I'm very excited for that one. All right, so we're going to keep you on the mic here because we have Pick What Agascalis plays coming up here. So it uh, looks like we have some shooters, which is um, a little odd, I guess, for Mr. Gascalis because not only will he play the story modes, but he's going to dip his toe into multiplayer also. So we got four options here this week. We got Battlefield One. And this is all on PC, correct? All right, but it's not going to matter. Uh, yeah, this is all on PC. Okay, so we got Battlefield One, which kind of started on already. Uh, Battlefield Bad Company Two, Call of Duty Black Ops Three, and Call of Duty Ghosts. So I'm going to start with you, Swiss. What what did you choose for Mr. Gascles to play? And, and we have to pick two of them this time. You said right. Yes. Yeah. The 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 stick on this is uh, what I'm offering up in sacrifice is uh, before the releases of the next iterations of Battlefield and Call of Duty this fall is to kind of give us an opportunity to kind of reminisce and think about uh, iterations gone past. So I'm leaving it up to you guys. I don't think any. I didn't think any any one of these uh, was worthy of being a place pick by itself because um, they're fairly light on content. Um, you know, a lot of it's multiplayer you know a lot of the values multiplayer so I, I offered up the opportunity to pick two and then you guys can decide you know what type of experience you want to uh, invoke by however you choose to mix and match those right so you already played some battlefield one this week that probably would have been my pick but because you've already played it i'm gonna do something else <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll go with Battlefield. So just, b- before before you finalize it, just to make it clear, that was like forty five minutes, fifteen minutes of which was <laughs> like configuring the game and setting my keyboard settings, right? So it's up to you if you want to consider that off the chessboard. But I just wanted to offer that clarification. Okay. And no multiplayer. Remember, you can, he's going to play multiplayer this time. Okay. All right. He obviously you want to play Battlefield One, <laughs> so I'll throw that in there. <laughs> so I, I, I are, look. When these things come up, I honestly want to play whatever you guys want to pick. I just wanted you to understand that it's not like I spent like four to eight hours playing Battlefield One. Then that, why, like, why are you criticizing my my the way I'm choosing? It's like you're like you know what you're like. Susan? You're like the crabby coworker that gets mad when they get beat in the March Madness pool to the secretary that just picks which mascot she likes better. <laughs> That's what you are right I, now. I have no ego associated <laughs> with any one of these titles because whatever you guys pick, they'll all, right. all come back up in the rotation at some point. So it's <laughs> totally up to you. <laughs> I the battlefield game that I'm most interested in is Battlefield One. So I will let I will pick that, and I will pick Call of Duty Ghosts because it's older than Call of Duty Black Ops Three. <laughs> nice. All right. Before you get to my pick, did you hear from uh, Mr. DBQ Hams? Unfortunately. Radio silence. Oh, okay. So, right. um, we probably, forgot to, yeah, we forgot to remind him. Maybe yeah. I should have asked him yesterday. Yeah, yeah. I forgot. That's all right. Uh, well, well, I'm going to make it unanimous because I also was going to pick uh, Battlefield 1 and Call of Duty Ghosts. And my reason it was just, I wanted to take it easy on you, actually, is just because of the multiplayer side, at least. Just because I think it's a little bit more forgiving, um, especially which, on, which on one? the Call of Duty. Ghost or Battlefield 1? Both, actually. Uh, I think, well, more so probably ghosts, just because uh, you don't have all the jumping around and, you know, all these different kind of suits and stuff. It's just kind of just, you know, on the ground battling. You have gadgets and stuff, but it's not that bad, so. so. Because I think you're definitely not taking it easy on me on the multiplayer, on the the single player, because I already know I hate the Call of Duty Ghost single player campaign. That's That's the one with the dog, right, and the two brothers? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I beat that one, yeah. Yeah. I I played through that one. 
Yeah. yeah, it's a horrible story, by the way. Well, not horrible. It's just kind of generic. It's really just it's, generic. I story. feel like it's watching like the two brothers on Supernatural, except <laughs> they're in a setting that they are like completely, like not out of their elements. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, you know, I played it easy on, on one side. On the other side, hey, that's, <laughs> I didn't so, realize that. No, it's cool. So that's is, good. <laughs> is Supernatural ever going to be on the um, the entertainment podcast? Uh, not well, as of right now because we're always we're always on to like the the new thing. Uh, and Supernatural is not a short format. Uh, yeah, they're full seasons, like yeah. twenty episodes at least. Yeah. yeah. Now I will say, this is totally like listeners, you're totally behind the curtain now, right? And, and figuring <laughs> out how we like make the sausage and, and figure these things out. I will say, I, I am a fan of the rewatchable kind of format. That's actually another podcast, another network, uh, and they they do these things where. They go back and they like rewatch, like you know, and they and they do like three to five episodes at a time or something like that. Uh, that might be the only way I ever get through Supernatural. So I don't know. That's something we can kick around and discuss, I guess. Nice. It's funny you mention that because I'm rewatching Stargate, the Stargate TV series right now. So ah, very nice. Yeah, very interesting because uh, fr- friend friend of the entertainment show, Mr. Joseph Malazzi, uh, you know, we still uh, we still keep up with and keep track of. Of course, he was a, a writer uh, on that series, so. Uh, so nice. And just announced this week that he is going to be uh, diving into uh, uh, writing comic books. So, oh, nice. Very interested to see uh, cool. what he does with that. Totally non sequitur, but related. Yes. It's entertainment. <laughs> so that's fine. Right. It's a conversational uh, podcast. <laughs> speaking of which, let's, let's plug uh, anything for uh, the coming uh, shows. Do you have an entertainment uh, one that you're working we, on right we now? Do, we do. We're trying to figure it out. So we, so we have been doing Cloak and Dagger. We've done two episodes. Uh, nice. and, and, and first of all, if, if you didn't realize this, it, it was kind of informal and meandering. We just kind of came about it. So the entertainment uh, series of shows... Um, rather than individually titling them, uh, we're just we're just canning the whole entertainment uh, uh, what, uh, content pool on the E2KG network under the podcast title "It's Another Thing," because um, that's kind of what we do, right? We we wrap up a short format television series of anywhere from six to thirteen episodes, uh, cover that in uh, some number of podcasts, and then wrap it up, put a bow on it, take a break, and then move on to the next thing when it drops. Uh, so. Um, so right now we're covering Cloak and Dagger. We've done uh, two podcast shows covering episodes uh, one and two and then three and four. Uh, we are trying to nail down a specific schedule for the third uh, show where we will cover episodes five and six. That will probably be uh, sometime between uh, Wednesday and Sunday of this week. So that should be available here uh, pretty shortly. Cool. Nice. Uh, so you got any last words before we wrap up here for tonight? Any plugs? Uh, nope. Don't have any plugs. Just um, guess next week. I think DB reports out, right? And yeah. not sure who's up for the play segment, but this is interesting now that we're going to have the play segment every week. Yeah, so that'll be fun. I think it's my turn coming up next next week, I believe. Because you had um, was it God of War the last time you did yours was uh, I am I might be up there. Yeah, it so, was BattleTech, so, I think. So next week, next so next week Monday on E2KG Deep Dive, uh, it'll be uh, Swiss, myself, and DBQ, uh, just doing the news and discussion thing. And then next okay. week on the core show, it'll be myself, DBQ, and you, Prime, and DBQ. I don't know why I have. That's not right. So he'll be reporting out on the July seventeenth show. But yes, he'll, right. he'll report out on uh, his humble bundle thing next week and uh administratively well i don't know so administratively i, I might report out as well i'm um, just oh, okay. trying to get us back on track but i guess pr- prime you'll you'll be in the in the buffer the for uh for the next plays pick okay i've already got an idea for that <laughs> it's gonna be a doozy yeah. <laughs> daikatana <laughs> <laughs> no i don't know Got something Post- special coming up for for this one. Postal. <laughs> Postal, no. Not going anything like mature or anything like that. Go in the opposite direction, actually, if, if anything. But anyways, all right. So come back. Uh, we'll come back next Monday, as uh, I guess Clee said, for episode number two of uh, The Deep Dive. And then next Tuesday for our uh, episode number 53 of Enough to Keep Going. So, Mr. Swiss, Mr. Stamos, thank you for the uh, show tonight. It was very good. Loved it. 
uh, everybody, please uh, join us on our podcast, all our podcasts, and on the E2KG network. And we will see you next week. <laughs>